and welcome to a sun-kissed green yards, home of Melrose Rugby Club and of course home to the Melrose Sevens, the original Sevens tournament, the brainchild of Ned Haig who himself played here back in 1883 in the very first tournament and how things have changed in the intervening years and after a, a two-year hiatus we're back in 2022 for the latest instalment and I'm delighted to say that alongside me is a man who knows a thing or two about Rugby Sevens. He's played for Scotland at Ibrox in the Commonwealth Games in 2014. He's graced this very surface, well, when it was a full grass pitch, uh, as a Selkirk player back in the mid to late noughties, it would be Lee. Right. Lee Jones with us. Lee, delighted to have you along. Yeah, good to be here, and it's great to be back at Melrose in the event going ahead. Given the past few years, um, it's, a, it's a big part of the Scottish rugby calendar. Um, and it's great to see the sun out and we'll get the crowds in the gates shortly and it's a, it's going to be a good day. There's a nip in the air for the, the start of the, the tournament. It's getting it underway in just a short time with Glasgow Hawks up against Musselburgh. The surface, though, is completely different. The first time it's been on an artificial mm -hmm. surface, this, the first time that the Green Yards has had this showpiece occasion with the opportunity to use floodlights for the final. Yeah, it's interesting. The pitch looks great. Um, and it'll be, it'll be interesting for the players, maybe some that haven't played in a surface like this before, but what it will give is a real consistency to the games. Um, I think we might have lost that banking that went down towards the try line, which made it a wee bit easier if you're if you running in there. Um, it's a bit more level, but um, no, it should be, it, it'll make for some good rugby, some fast rugby. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. 26 teams this afternoon involved in the action. You, you look across the draw, there's teams obviously from Fiji, teams from France, the Belgian international seven side are at a guest side this afternoon, but there's going to be a lot of eyes, I'd imagine, on the Samurai branded seven side and the co-optimist who boast, you know, the South African legend in Cecil Africa. He's going to catch uh, the eye this afternoon and, and capture the imagination of a lot of people, I'd imagine. Yeah, I would think so, and that's the thing with Melrose Sevens. There's a, there's a unique element of it brings in invitational sides against club teams um, some star players some big name players and it's a, it's that real mix of semi-professional professional and club players it's something that's very unique to Melrose um, so looking forward to see how the how the club teams um, go up against those invitational sides and you've mentioned a few there Samurai uh, co-optimists looking particularly strong um, and it'll be great to see you know, Cecil Africa at a, a sevens great world player of the year um, gone by and um, you know he's, he's still a quality player so looking forward to seeing how he pulls a few strings today. And just over the road he was inducted into the Melrose Sevens Hall of Fame on Thursday night so yet to start in the tournament but just because of his presence and his skills and, and the success that he's had in the game they felt quite rightly that he deserved a place. Yeah, I think he, he's been over all week and you see what's going out on social media. He's, they've done training sessions with the kids and stuff and that just it kind of brings around the whole community um, and really boosts the, the profile of the Sevens to have someone like that coming along, not only to, to be around but to, to play as well um, and showcase his skills. It'll be great for the players around with it him, it'll be great for the players against him and it'll be great for the crowds to watch. Now, we're talking there about uh, Cecil Africa, he's part of a co-optimist side. Do you fancy that they seem to be a lot of people's favourite? Could they go all the way? Um, it, it's hard to look past them. I think they'll do well. My local club, Selkirk, potentially play them in the second round, so I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, but no, it's one of these things with 26 teams and you look at the draw, you're, you're hard pushed to, to predict that. Um, I think co-optimists will go well. Samurai will be strong, as we mentioned, um, but you can you can never predict. It's it's sevens as well. Sevens can go either way, and that's what makes it that's what makes it such a great game. Yeah, the green yards nestled in the foothills of the Eildons, which are just behind us at the moment. A sense of anticipation as we await the first tie. That, of course, is Glasgow Hawks against Musselburgh coming up. Who will star? Who will be? a name that will join the pantheon of greats that have played here at the Green Yards in this wonderful tournament. We'll find out during the course of the day. Always a very intriguing first round draw at the Melrose Sevens with the likes of Selkirk up against Ayr, Hoyk winners back in 1967 taking on Stirling County in the second round and a very intriguing tie between Edinburgh Ackies, the beaten finalists back in 2019 against Jed Forrest who've also reached the final in recent times. But our focus will be on two ties, Kelso against the Coptimists and the Samurai versus Heriots. 
There is a man making many headlines this weekend, Cecil Africa, officially retired back in 2020, but here at Melrose for this season's competition. James Johnson, of course, skippering the side and very much the architect of an early score to give the Coptimists the lead, a side that many people will fancy they can go all the way to the final. Kelsey themselves, of course, regular finalists between 1978 and the mid-1990s, seven times winners trailed early on. Vandale's pass on to Johnson and the acceleration of many Pacey Coptimist players clear to see from halfway. Despite the best efforts of a well-marshalled Kelsey defence, it was going to be the visiting side who would take the lead. It was more of the same with that man Africa, the architect inside his own 22, releasing James Johnson, a familiar face around Murrayfield, an Edinburgh professional player, running more than half the length of the field despite tracking back from the likes of the experienced Bruce McNeil. But Kelsey's number one on the day, no slouch himself, just unable to meet the pace of James Johnson. Africa looking to add a Melrose Sivens medal to his vast collection which includes Olympic and Commonwealth medals of course well in excess of a thousand points scored in the sevens game but this was going to be Johnson's moment as he touched down there's another two points to add to the Africa points tally a smile on his face and no wonder but Andy Tate and Kelso look to strike back that scrummage going against the head, though, produced an opportunity for another pacey player, Freddie Osley, down that right-hand side, down the stand side, and again, cross-field defensive cover by Kelson. Not quite enough to slow down the professional winger. He's delighted to make a contribution in the opening round of the tournament. Once more, quick ball, Osley, very well known around the sprinting circuit as well, was able just to swivel his way around from close range to score. And how about this for a conversion from right on the touchline, showing the quality not just with pace, ball in hand, but also boot to ball. So the Coptimists off and running with a successful first round dispatch of Kelso. Miguel Reina and Samurai were next up, up against Heriot's ex-winners, no strangers to the green yards, but Reina was in very quickly to open his account. Sniper scrum halves who can finish off like this are going to be an important weapon in the armoury of a side looking to do well in the bottom half of the draw. Reina this time the architect from almost halfway showing pace to work his way around a Heriot's defence, a very hard working Heriot's defence and offload on the deck picked up by John Daw. The recycling play of Samurai was certainly catching the eye. The ball worked its way out to Mata and then eventually out to Charlie Walker. And Walker weaved up to within five metres of the line before reinforcements coming in. Mata once more, this time with the offload. And it was number 11, Frankie Suto, in for the latest try. Samurai were undoubtedly impressive in their first round against Heriot's, showing a vast array of seven skills that would serve them well during the course of the tournament. Teams willing to run it from their own 22 in the opening round of a competition are certainly going to be appreciated by the vast crowd inside the green yards. And how about this for a solo piece of running from Max McFarland? A little offload, he wasn't going to finish off that move himself, but he had a man on his shoulder in the form of Will Henry. And Henry was in for another try as the samurai side were certainly putting Heriot's well and truly to the sword, mounting up score after score, 71 points to nil, an emphatic, a record-breaking win for a team that certainly had eyes on a prolonged appearance in the competition. So in two round two, and the hosts Melrose, one of a number of sides to make it into the second round, courtesy of a bye, one of the seeded teams. 
that would go straight into round two. They would take on Aberdeen in the penultimate tie of the round. The Belgian international seven would play Watsonians, while Jed Forrest, a recent beaten finalist, would face London Scottish Lions. London Scottish, of course, winning the last Melrose Sevens back in 2019. But our focus would be on Curry against Loma Viti, the Fijian visiting side, and the British Army up against Stirling County. The British Army would be up against the men from Bridgehawk in round two. And it was Solana Buku who opened the scoring with this try from his own 10 metre line, racing away despite the best covering defence from Stirling County. A sweeper in a high line defensive position, and the Army opening up the Stirling County defence early on in the tie to run underneath the posts for the opening score. This is an illustration of the pace that the army would bring to the Melrose Sevens. Determination on the face. And I'm sure he was delighted to get his side's opening score, get them off and running. Perhaps something of a dark horse, the British Army. Tulili was going to be the architect of many moves, their number nine, but again, just being able to ride a challenge and once again get underneath the post for the valuable further two points with a conversion coming. Rocker Tiguni would be the second player to smash the ball down there in delight and ground the ball for a further five points. To Lily again, timing the pass. Stirling County perhaps a little disappointed with the defensive cover. But the Army were just laying down a marker for what they could produce. Phil Graham picking up the ball on the right-hand side would be denied on this occasion. But once again, to Lily recycling ball and these army players almost queuing up. An illustration coming up of how secure they are, offloading one-handed, and this time Tulili would finish off himself. A well-earned try for the British Army number nine. Something of a, a skill that the Fijians have perfected for many years now, the one-handed offload out the back door, nine on nine, but Stirling County had no answer for the power of this British Army team. You felt though they had something in reserve, at all important during a sevens competition, of course. Phil Graham and his side would be marching purposefully onto the quarter-finals. Curry were certainly disappointed seven days ago after losing the Tenants Premiership final to Mar, but they came out the blocks absolutely flying. Cameron Lessels, a weaving run with the support of Fergus Scott, and Curry using the full width of the green yards with Fraser Sawyers in underneath the posts for a fine score in their match against the Fijian guest side, Lomaviti. Lomaviti disappointed not to have Wasaya Sarevi as part of their coaching staff. Sarevi himself gracing the stage and would appreciate the skill set of Fergus Scott and his team, the men in gold and black, tracking down that left-hand side. And once again, Fraser Sawyers was the man to finish things off. He's been a, an important component in the Curry 7 squad, as well as their starting 15. They were happy to run it from deep, and once again, you could see Lessers and Sawyers running from their own 22, opening up an opportunity, this time for Charlie Brett. His offload was secure, spin pass from Stephen Hamilton brought Fergus Scott into play, and out on that right-hand side, there was more width and opportunity for Curry to come good once more. The second try coming this time in the second period. And Loma Viti, a Fijian side with uh, a reputation, were suddenly on the ropes. Curry then through to the quarter-finals, one of the Edinburgh sides looking to stamp their authority on the tournament, not one with such a rich history as the likes of Edinburgh Aki's, Stuart Melville and Watsonians, but certainly marching in the right direction. So moving into the last eight of the competition, the French side Seventus would take on the British Army. Curry would face the co-optimist while in the bottom half of the draw. It would be Samurai against Jed Forrest and the hosts Melrose against the Belgian International 7 Select.
Inside Saventus, who dispatched Musselburgh in the second round, were up against the British Army in the first of the quarter-finals, and Sula Kualu was in imperious form as he touched down early on to give the Army side the lead. Perhaps looking for a little bit of heavenly support in the sunshine at the Green Yards, but a perfect start for the Army. And once again, an illustration of the quality of handling and the turn of pace that they were able to produce. The Army again showing confidence from their own 10 metre line to open up a, a French team who have been visitors at Melrose Sevens in the past but perhaps haven't faced this level of opposition for quite some time and Sulaqualu once more backing himself to finish off a fine try but needing a little bit of support from his teammate Ravalu. Sulaqualu running in almost dotting down in exactly the same spot for try number two despite a, a nasty collision after touching down. The second of the quarter-finals paired the Coptimists with Curry and Cecil Africa and James Johnson were on hand to release Freddie Osley to score a try between the 10 and the 22, off he goes, and he was not going to be stopped despite the best efforts of Fraser Sawyers. However, the assistant referee had flagged and attracted the referee's attention. An incident prior to the line-out had caught the match official's eye. And Freddie Osley, to the amazement of many around the green yards, including Cecil Africa, was shown only the second red card in the history of the competition. Here, a collision with Fergus Scott, picked up by the assistant, the shoulder coming in around the neck and head. And the officials in agreement that that was worthy of a red card. Only Morgan Ward, back in 2012, has also received a similar punishment. Curry then were up against six men for two-thirds of the tie and the pace of Charlie Brett and the positioning and finishing skills of James McCaig ensuring that Curry would make full use of the extra man and the extra space on the park. Again, Fergus Scott using his experience, the good step from Charlie Brett, the offload to McCaig and the finishing power despite the best efforts of James Johnson and his teammates. Jed Forrest, the 1974 winners certainly like a challenge, they've plenty of pace in the ranks, but Miguel Reyna and the Samurai side felt that they had the upper hand early on, scoring a try, opening up a gap for Will Glover to touch down underneath the post and test the resolve of the Riverside men. Quality play from Miguel Reyna, who's fast becoming one of the players of the tournament they offload, providing an opportunity for Glover to cut through a Jed Forrest defence and touch down underneath the posts. When Jenkins and Miguel Reyna then open up an opportunity for Max McFarland to track down the left-hand side, but some brilliant Jed Forrest defence slowed up the Samurai on this occasion, but here recycled ball, a little gap in the Jed defence, and Will Glover was over for yet another score. Samurai getting into their groove against a, a Borders team, one of the best in the business. McFarland, again, knowing that Reyna would be in the right position at the right time to play the pass to secure Glover in for a score. Melrose would take on Belgian opposition in the quarterfinals. The Belgian national side joining the likes of Germany and Sweden as a recent European team to grace the stage at the Green Yards. But Strun Hutchison and the Melrose side, the youngsters, too strong for them in the opening stages of the tie, trying to build up a head of steam as they themselves had aspirations to repeat the successes of Melrose teams in the past. The home of Melrose Sevens enjoyed the skills of the likes of Patrick Anderson and Kieran Clark and Stroon Hutchison was once again in the right place at the right time to finish off a move to ease them past a Belgian team who were disappointed to make no further in the last eight. And this group of Melrose youngsters simply too strong for their Belgian visitors. A straightforward quarter-final win taking a place in the semi-finals in a mouth-watering contest against Samurai. So through to the semi-finals, the British Army against Curry and Samurai versus Melrose. The unfancied Curry had made it through to the semi-finals of the Melrose Sevens, perhaps uncharted territory for the men from Millennium Park. They were looking for a bright start as the afternoon sunshine headed towards early evening and 
Chanders were cast that little bit longer on the green yards pitch. But how about this for a start from the British Army, latching on to a bouncing ball from the kick-off and the power of the forwards doing the good work to begin with. Then Phil Graham was able to pick up an offload to Kulamavasi. A one-on-one -on -one situation opening up here against the captain, Fergus Scott, but he was able just to sideswipe Scott and run in for an opening try inside the first 30 seconds of the contest. And you felt that the army had more in their armoury to show against Curry and any other sides they would face this afternoon. A good start then for the visitors from Aldershot. Kulamavasi then, the one-on-one -on -one situation, despite the best efforts of Fergus Scott, a powerful figure of the Fijian. Quite the sight to see. Crowd healthy in number, watching on with interest, beginning to wonder if the army could well take the silverware south. Another traditional one-handed offload. And how about this for a piece of play from Kane Borsch? Brought into the side from the losing side, Seventus, in the quarter-final. An angled run up towards the 22. And again, pace and power finishing things off as Rukadrell was able to get within three metres of the line. Determined efforts, brilliant defensive play from Curry, but just not enough in Fraser Sawyer's armoury to deny the British Army a second try. That coming courtesy of Gondol. Tracking down the left-hand side, using the full width of the pitch there. Sawyers with an excellent tackle, but the follow-up play was so crucial from the British Army, and Sawyers on this occasion was unable to stop the Army scoring yet another try. They were spreading the ball now with great confidence, almost at walking pace, and having Kane Borsch in their side was just a, another valuable attribute, and Borsch then outpacing Sawyers down the right-hand side to run in for a try. Perhaps he was thinking that at the very least, he would leave the green yards with a medal of some colour. Having been disappointed to go out at the quarter-finals with Seventus, he was certainly going to make his presence felt in this squad. Touching down in the policeman's corner. Got a smile on his face, but I'm sure inwardly he was a satisfied man. The British Army then the first of the sides through to the final. The first final ever to be played on an artificial surface. Had they left enough in the tank to take on whoever they would face in the second semi-final? It was, of course, the Samurai up against Melrose. A partisan home crowd were dreaming of a Melrose British Army final, but the Samurai had other ideas, and John Daw tracking down the right-hand side despite the best efforts of Struan Hutchison was in for an early score, perhaps setting the tone for an excellent tie. Melrose were down, but they're certainly by no means out. The determination of this young group of Melrose players had served them well as they were able to reach the semi-final. This, though, was perhaps the stiffest test they would face in some time. The Samurai again, a confident team that can build from deep. Miguel Reyna, one of the players of the tournament, an architect of many a score. How about this for a piece of powerful running? And the, the number 12 during the course of the afternoon, Owen Jenkins, was this time the supplier. The move finished off there by Jamie Mata. Referee Ross Maben satisfied with that score. And once again, Mata was just on hand to receive the pass from Owen Jenkins. 1 2 offload. And Mata in for the try. Conserving energy becomes even more important at the semi-final stage. Kieran Clark unable to slow him up. Melrose would fight to the finish. 24-7 down during the closing stages of the tie. They still felt there was an opportunity to at least apply a little bit more pressure on the Samurai side. And how about this for a finish? Struan Hutchison on to the youngster, Hamish Weir. And we are determined to get as close to those posts as possible. I'm sure his father and family were delighted with the efforts there. Up back on his feet quickly, looking for a quick consolation conversion. Melrose perhaps not quite enough time to turn this tie around, but the biggest cheer of the afternoon surely going the way of Hamish and his teammates. A brave effort then from this young Melrose side, but it wasn't quite enough after a semi-final against the quality opposition, those that many people felt were the favourites from the bottom half of the draw. Samurai, having put Heriots to the sword in the opening round, then dispatched Gala and Jed Forrest in the second and quarter-finals before defeating the hosts Melrose in the semi-finals. They were safely through then to face the British Army, a mouth-watering prospect in store.
Well, Pete Horn is with me now, and Pete, it's two guest sides that have made it through to the final of the 2022 Melrose Sevens. We looked at the draw and thought, well, the bottom half, it's going to take somebody really special to beat Samurai. Perhaps no surprise that they've made it through to the final. The British Army are there as well, and with all due respect to them, perhaps not having had to play their best rugby and negotiating just three ties. Yeah, and all the army have been, you know, physical. They've been dominating collisions, and they've just almost overpowered all their their opposition. Like you said, they've probably not been tested nearly as much as as Samurai down the bottom half, who are coming into the final having had two real stern tests against two of the home sides in, in Jed and Melrose. So uh, it'll be a cracking final. There's plenty of pace, but you know the British Army have obviously got a lot of power on the other side. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. It is a, a real mix of styles. You know, two very different styles coming together. You. You feel that the, the British Army would want to get on the front foot early because if the Samurai do show their qualities, I'm not entirely sure if the British Army have necessarily the wherewithal to come from behind to win this final. I 100% agree with you. You know, Samurai have done really well to get out the blocks quick and both of those ties against Jed and Melrose, they scored a couple of quick tries to kind of you know, get a good lead and then they looked comfortable in defence, didn't they? They defended really well and... They almost look like they've got an extra gear, don't they? They've got a couple of players in Max McFarlane and Jamie Mata, who's been excellent, you know, who it looks like they can create something out of nothing anytime they get the ball in a bit of space. They're looking really dangerous. So, uh, okay, it's been, it's good. The army on the other side, like you said, they're a bit more unpredictable. You don't quite know how they're, you know, what they're going to do. They've got guys that can, you know, step you in a phone box, but also run over the top of you. So, uh, well, it'll be a cracking final. I'm looking forward to it. From a Borders point of view, Jed Forrest and Melrose have enjoyed a great deal of support in the latter rounds of the competition. But I think it's worth mentioning Curry, a word on them, and the fact that they've made the semi-finals. Maybe a bit of a surprise package. Yeah, I think speaking to... Uh, one of the guys in the, the press box was speaking to Ferg Scott before it and he was joking about how he's never played sevens before, you know, and EK, I think they turned up probably not expecting to go nearly as far as they did, but I was so impressed with their defence. They made, they, they were dogged in defence, they worked so hard, they put teams under pressure and ultimately they just tired teams out and eventually when they got the ball they were so, you know, in, in great positions to capitalise and score some great tries. So, uh, no, they all, it was brilliant. I think the first time they've ever made the, the semi-finals, so uh, a real success story for them and and one, the crowd were certainly getting behind them in the in the latter stages there. And the flip side, the co-optimists going out in the, the quarterfinals and a red card that has got everybody talking here. Yeah, there was a little bit of controversy around the red card. None of us kind of saw what had happened there. Eh? I think uh, the guys in the boxes had a look back and it looked like there might have been some sort of little contact to the head before the line-out even took place. So... Uh, Oh, it was a bit disappointing in a way for them. You know, they had a good team, some, and they were kind of just starting to hit their straps. And I think the crowd would have enjoyed seeing Cecil Africa and Co running about in, in this final. But um, oh look, well, I'm sure there'll be a great spectacle nonetheless. So it's the first floodlit final, first on the artificial surface. Who's your money on? I'm struggling to see past Samurai. They've just got, they've got so much in there. They're, they look quick, but they look fit as well. And any time it's gotten a bit physical against Melrose there, the, the young Melrose boys were really taking it to them and they just dealt with it. You know, they were brilliant at the breakdown. They, they really kind of mixed the rough with the smooth and I was really impressed with them. So, uh, no, I fancy them. They're talisman, Mata. I think, yeah, they'll, they'll just have too much. Yeah, the crowd are five and six deep around the green yards in anticipation of a final. We're certainly looking forward to it. It's a, a battle between the British Army and Samurai. A lot of people will fancy that Samurai may well come out on top. Could there be a surprise? We'll find out who will win the 2022 Melrose Sevens very shortly. Melrose Simmons organisers arranged a tribute to the late Tom Smith who lost his brave battle with cancer on the 6th of April. Tom won 61 caps for Scotland and appeared for the British and Irish Lions in two tours in 1997 and 2001. Before the final there was a stirring rendition of Highland Cathedral and immense applause from everyone inside the ground. Tom was a Melrose Sevens runner with Watsonians back in 1996.
2022 Melrose Sevens final then gets underway and immediately Charlie Walker is able to steal the ball there with a little off road Will Hendy up towards the edge of the 22 Walker goes in just behind now it's an early touch in this final for Jamie Mata floated across field a bit uncertainty in that uh, British Army defence there as uh, Samurai again all in green for this final with the Army all in red just trying to unsettle the British Army defence inside the opening minute and Pete that was uh, somebody who with your own skill set you'll appreciate the use of the, the cross field kick particularly when it causes such disruption I'm surprised he went to the boot there like they've been they've been so good with ball in hand I'm, I'm surprised he took the risk but it, like you said it nearly paid off he had a man in space, if he got a slightly better bounce, he was in for the score. Tulele feeding the ball into this British Army scrum. Deep inside their own 22, carrying it, running into Jamie Mata. Offloaded once again by Tulele. But still Samurai applying the pressure, just trying to hem in the British Army. As again they, they run into Jamie Mata once more. Ball goes loose, picked up there by Will Hendy. And the Army's 22 has been well worked just at the moment. The ball just flying over the head there of Miguel Reyna, one of the star players during the, the course of the, the tournament this, this afternoon. I would uh, imagine that Pete, he would be certainly on your short list of players to win player of the tournament. I think he's been excellent. Both the, the Spaniards and the and the Samurai team have been outstanding. Um, for me so far, Jamie Matt has kind of edged it. He's been uh, at the heart and soul of everything good around Samurai. He makes them tick, but he's got real dog in defence. You know, he works so hard, fights for absolutely everything, and he's got great pace as well to finish any little half breaks he makes. Into on, the scrum. Rather lateral. Ball allowed to bounce. Again, just into the... 22, no penalty being awarded to Samurai, quick tap there, taken on then by Reina, offloaded towards Hendy, across on that left-hand side is Daw, the captain of the side, occupying a position on the left, they'll cut it back, infield, closing in, penalty awarded this time though to the British Army, both sides you can tell are just sizing each other out just at the moment as the Army now with a, an opportunity to go, some gas to burn here, and it's a uh, Kane Burge is uh, on the field of play, so too though is Philip Graham and it's Philip Graham who accelerates up towards the edge of the 22, Graham with that uh, unorthodox offload and the army are going to be in through Silva Bequalo underneath the post for the opening try and it was a great lung busting run from Philip Graham on the angle up and beyond the halfway line, he was aiming towards the, the corner, he couldn't arc the run round but he knew that uh, Sulu Bukwalu was just on his shoulder and it was all about the execution of the pass to bring in his teammate on the 22 and he was able to accelerate in for the opening score. And I think a lot of people felt, Pete, that uh, to make this a, a really enthralling contest, if the British Army were to get a, a bit of a head of steam up and a lead on with that converted try now being uh, given by the referee, and it would certainly make the many neutrals inside the, the, the green yard sit up and take notice today. Definitely. Like we talked about earlier, Samurai have been out the block so quick in the last couple of games. They've got a couple of scores on the board before anyone can kind of even realise the game started. So uh, exactly what we're after. The, the Army with a brilliant score off the back of some brilliant defence, you know, down in their own 22. And it just shows the quality they've got. They can they can run it in from anywhere. King Bors was one of uh, the... French visiting sides squad players selected by the British Army to play in the semi-final and the final. Seventis going out to the British Army in the quarter-finals and the Army have won a penalty which they will quickly take and tap and again you could see Silva Kualu was in position there perhaps to receive possession of the ball but uh, it's the Samurai we knocked the ball on there and you could see he was glancing to the heavens there, Philip Graham, because I think he felt that uh, an opportunity was uh, coming calling for the British Army to get a second try on the board in this first half. It's been a productive four and a half minutes. That will certainly rock Samurai if the Army can make the most of this pressure here. To the Lee will feed the ball into the scrum alongside him is Miguel Reina. 
to Lilly, almost losing his balance. Thinks about the offload. Now he's able just to float the pass out towards this left hand channel. But just going into touch there. You could see the players were beginning to just drift across. They move so well, the Fijian boys, don't they? Just brilliant goosey there. Gets on the outside. Makes a uh, Makes, was it Max McFarland there? Makes him turn in and he just can't quite execute the pass. Luko Denui is just across on that left hand side, waiting, just biding his time to receive the ball as it's now a chance for Reina to feed the ball into the scrum. Quick offload there from Mata. Now they'll spread the ball out towards this left hand side. Now the acceleration up and beyond halfway. The British Army have got a sweeper back here and they. Again, Samurai breakaway runner just colliding with the sweeper rather than working his way around. Well, Hendy now, he goes round the corner, he strikes the straight arm, he knows he's not going to make it underneath the posts, but he has returned down into the 22, over the line and grounded five points for the Samurai side, who were trailing at it for the first time in the tournament when they, they lost that converted score earlier on. Seven points to five is the score in the final now, with the kick to come absolute pace from Max McFarlane there. I thought Tulele done such a good job sweeping. He held off, he bought a bit of time for Philip Graham to get back. You know, he kind of put Max in two doubts. He didn't just give him an easy inside shoulder and he didn't give him the outside either. It was brilliant because that's so tough to do, you know, especially down the middle of the field like that. Um, you know, he makes a good tackle, but ultimately brilliant follow up by uh, by Hendy and a, and a good score. And an excellent conversion attempt from out wide, seven points all. So both sides scores on the board. They feel a little bit, a bit more settled into the contest. Lossi Veriemi, I think, was looking to come on to the, the field of play there, but he's been ushered back, the British Army number five, as the restart kick is floated high. and. Uh, you can see the army going after that roll Glover with hands in the air but the army steal the ball back stung by that try scored just moments ago from this samurai side who will be many people's favourites to win the trophy in this final day Sanderson Silver Salva up for grabs for the runners up of course and the Centina Ladies Cup will go the way of the winners. The referee just puts whistle to mouth, he's gone for half time. Seven all then the score. And you have to say, Pete, from a neutral's point of view, that's exactly what you wanted from the first half. A bit more from the army and uh, a little bit of uncertainty perhaps at times from Samurai. Definitely, it's great that the game's still in the balance at seven all. The army look really good. It's the, like we talked about, it's the first time they've been tested. The one thing that's letting them down is just that cutting edge with their, their kind of basics. You know, they're, they're doing really well. They're, they're so difficult to tackle, the way they're moving, you know, those goose steps. They're, get there you know they're really standing up the samurai boys if they could just execute some of the these passes when, once they've done the hard work they uh, you know they're not far away from a, a couple more line breaks you can see that uh, Luke Rivalu has come on to join the players in the huddle and he's not been moving all that freely since I think the early stages of the semi-final when they seem to injure a hamstring I think he tweaked it in the quarterfinals as well, to be honest, but uh, he'll be a, a player, I'm sure, that will want to make a contribution in the final. You do want to utilise the full squad of players at your disposal, and, and the players certainly will want to be part of it, given the, the very fact that it is Melrose Sevens, the kudos about playing in a final and being able to uh, perhaps go for one of those very sought-after winners' medals. Absolutely. It's something you, you, know, you definitely want to be part of, especially late in the game. You know, seven minutes to go now, whole crowd in. You want to be, you know, the man that gets the crowd on their feet and gets them rowing you on and you score the winner for your team. As we mentioned earlier on in the afternoon, looking to be another visiting side, whether it be from mainland UK or from overseas, to lift the... Centenary Ladies Cup going back to Serge Blanco and back in 1983 when the French Barbarians beat Stuart's Melville in the final. And 84 years ago was the very first radio broadcast from the Green Yards and it's against Edinburgh is the final that day. The clip tones of Leo Hunter 
providing the description of a 10-5 win for the Golden Acre side. Back at the, the start of the, the second period, a little tap and go, and suddenly the British Army have got uh, some opportunities. Again, from a standing start, all that lovely little bit show and go there, and he was showing the ball to his own teammates, and he's in underneath the posts for a quality score there. And uh, Callum Obasa is the player who I thought perhaps should not feature all that prominently in the final, having sustained a knock earlier on in the contest, but uh, did draw in the Samurai team and uh, Pete certainly opened up a gap that uh, perhaps should never have been there for him to wander into. <laughs> he did, they just imposed themselves physically there, didn't they, the Army boys? Massive uh, collision. They got done really well in defence, they flew up, forced Mata back in, he hit Reyna, he kind of took contact where he probably didn't want to, and then they blasted that breakdown, got the turnover, and then the big man shrugs a couple of tackles. It's so tough to defend, but the way they can hold the ball and kind of wave it around, um, it makes it so tough to get in and stop an offload, especially when they're winning the collisions like that. Just brilliant by the Army boys. Uh, the, the first floodlit final, first final on this new artificial surface, of course, the restart kick then once more from Tulili. Ball goes loose, Samurai under the cost just at the moment, Tulili now up into that 22. Is he going to finish things off well? The British Army have just come good. They've almost been like the Italians in football, a quiet start, they gradually make their way through the competition, one or two raised eyebrows as they progress without really showing the qualities, but by goodness me, they're into the final now, and 19 points to 7 the scoreline, they're turning on the style when they have to, but this Samurai side that put the lights of Heriots to the sword, and Gala and Jed Forrest and Melrose all knocked out by these boys, not showing the true qualities right at this moment. No, they've, they've struggled, they've not really had the ball, have they? This second half, the army have dominated. They've uh, they've made a mess of any of, of the breakdowns and they're looking big and physical, breaking any sort of, you know, you, you can see Samurai getting a bit tired, they're not getting their feet in as close in the tackles, you know, there's a lot of reaching and diving off their feet to make their tackles and the, the big army boys are just breaking them. Rivalu goes long with the restart kick, Chris. Samurai are hemmed back inside their own 22. One or two players look a little bit shell-shocked, but they're a, a group of players that know each other so well and work together that they're slick operators. And if they were to score a try and convert it very quickly to bring the score to 19-14, it would certainly change the complexion of the game. But at the moment, it's the Army very much with the upper hand, and rightly so, with the qualities they've shown. Round the corner, trying to go for the, the line there, was the number 13, Will Glover, but he's been stolen and ripped. The offload was unconventional. Back out the back door once more, and they're in for yet another score. Wonderful piece of play there, and it's... Uh, Rokudugi, who's in for yet another score, and uh, Rokudunui has added his name to the list of British Army players to score a try in the final. I can't help it. I just the, the Fijian boys just make you smile. You know the way they they are. They just look like they're having so much fun. It's great to see. Oh, it looks like they've they've called it back. They've been a knock on. Yeah, they. Oh, four tasks with the offload at the back. Right. The referee and the assistant, after a quick consultation, has said, well, no further scoring, and it's uh, maybe a bit of a let-off for Samurai. And, well, they're five metres from their own line, so they've got some distance to cover with the, the clock very much against them. Just at the moment, again, Reyna just bringing Mata into play, down this right-hand channel, floodlights on at the green yards, eating into time in the second half of this Melrose Sevens final. The British Army on top at the moment. Maybe a, a slight surprise if they were to win the trophy, but all credit to them as Samurai working it down the left-hand channel once again with Will Glover. Glover still going, needs the offload. Successfully passes infield there and tracking in was Charlie Worth underneath the posts and how the importance of that disallowed score and that try at the other end a minute later is going to be to this final because it keeps it, Pete Horn, very much on the knife edge. Listen there. On a knife edge, exactly. 19-14, huge kickoff coming now. All of a sudden, the army just looked a little bit tired. They went from being in complete ascendancy to uh, looking a little bit shell-shocked there. Yeah, there's a, a nice sort of casual assurance about how they approach the sevens game when they're on the front foot, but uh, sometimes 
when the opposition get the upper hand, you can't necessarily get back into the groove and turn things around. But this British Army side has uh, certainly been tested this afternoon, perhaps uh, not uh, quite to the level of the, the Samurai in the quarterfinals and the semi-finals, but uh, nonetheless, they've been able to dispatch the lights of uh, Cementis from France, Curry, and of course, uh, still in County in the second round of the competition when they came in as one of the guest sides with a seed. And it's still 19-14 on the scoreboard. I'm surprised the Army haven't brought the, the wee winger that they picked up from Cementis on. I'm sure they brought him into the squad when they got an injury. He's stripped and ready down there. Oh, he? he was actually oh, there he stripped and ready uh, to come on. I thought he was on in the, the first half, but now he comes on. But Pete, it's it's a good point you make because uh, you know he was burning some gas down the wings, oh. and I think he'll occupy a place down this right hand side. Will Hendy here on the wing for Samurai must be thinking, oh God, here we go. I expect them to try and get up pretty high and almost force them back inside because you don't want to give this boy a a relatively fresh pair of legs in any space. Well, it's going to be a, a reset scrum, just adding to the tension there. Round the corner was McWalsh trying to work his way in towards the 22. Of course, that, an unconverted try would level the game at 19 points all, but British Army have this time been able to negotiate the scrum. They're still inside their own 22. That was a, a solid pass out there towards Borch, and Borch now, the jersey almost ripped from his back as he Tries to work it up towards his own 22. He may well be a, a British Army Sevens winner in just a few minutes' time. But again, the Army trying to escape the attentions down this left-hand side. Solid challenges coming in, but that's a good breakaway run down beyond the halfway line. Their immediate doing extremely well to gain some vital territory for the British Army. Little goose step on now towards Bord. Bord's now over the 10, over the 22. He'll cut inside. Bord almost runs into his own teammate. It doesn't matter. He's going to be in for the score. And that is icing on the cake. And the Army now lead by 24 points to 14. And I don't think there's any question over this particular tie. It was a little bit calamitous. It could have been beat on. But uh, no damage done in the end for the Army. He held on, did boards, and he scored in the final. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You can see how much it means to the Army boys. There's a bit of a, kind of a carnival happening down in front of us here on the sideline. Just, uh, like I said, you can't help but smile when they get going, the, the Fijian lads, they just love it. That's a lot of these guys are based down by older shots. And they'll enjoy the journey home as Melrose Sevens winners in 2022. 26 points to 14, and they're all going to congratulate the man that they've hired from the French side, Cementis, who they knocked out in the quarterfinals because it was he who scored that vital try at the end of the game just to ease any tensions. And the referee signalled the end of the contest after boards went in underneath the posts. And uh, you have to say, Pete Horan, that uh, it's a final and an outcome that we didn't necessarily expect. But uh, all credit to the army. When it was up for grabs, they produced the goods. You're bang on. Like we said, we, we fancied Samurai. I just thought they were going to have too much. They had a, a lot of pace, but they had a lot of you know, power and a lot of dog. I don't know if potentially they're just a little bit leggy having that extra tie, but so impressed with the army and typical kind of... Uh, Fijian fashion, just when they needed to, they, they go through the gears and they, they you know, shine the brightest when it's uh, on the biggest stage. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Some great individual skill, you know, just the, like I said, the, the footwork, the way they move, they just look, they look brilliant. Yeah, they've won some competitions in the past, Middlesex Sevens in uh, 2001 and 2004. And the Singapore Sevens back in 2004, and they wear the, the traditional colours, the mainly red jerseys with the white trims, it was formed 22 years ago, and uh, how they will enjoy the celebrations around the green yards this evening. The man of the moment, Miguel Reyna, with the player of the tournament trophy, of course, a new addition in 2022. And 
him and his teammates are back very quickly to receive the runners-up medals. The Duke of Buclou to the right of the picture, who of course donated the player of the tournament trophy, applauding the efforts of this year's runners-up. And the Sanderson Silver Salva collected there as uh, an award to the great efforts of this samurai team, who I'm sure will be disappointed not to leave with the Centenary Ladies Trophy. But that prize will go to these guys. The British Army, just too good in the end for Samurai, holding enough in reserve to win the final. And look quite emphatic at times in the final. And there you see now the Samurai players receiving their medals. Kane Borsch as well, of course, will be amongst the Samurai players. I'm sure to collect a winner's medal, one of the Seventis players who joined the ranks of the British Army for the semi-finals and final. And how about that? A joyous moment for the British Army and their coaching staff as they'll head south with the silverware. A new name on the Centenary Ladies' Cup, first presented to the French Barbarians and Serge Blanco back in 1983. It's in new hands for 12 months at least. That's it then for this year. From me, Stuart McFarlane, thanks very much for watching.